One of the things I hear the most with, in conversations, and it's a lot of people have come up to me and said it over the last few days, is, hey, I do a fair bit of sim, but I'm rubbish at debriefing. And I think a lot of that is, is the detachment between the sim lab environment and into our real workplace. So what, what I'm really going to aim to do over the next 20 minutes is kind of convince you guys that it's not about you as a debriefer. That's the main message that it's going to be. So when I was asked to, um, or when I was provided this talk title, it kind of got me going, oh, do I, do I go into a, a, some really intricate stories about clinical debriefs that I've been involved in? But this is the problem. We actually make debriefing inaccessible. The, the, all of the literature around it's generated out of big academic sim centres and um, it's, it's basically so far removed and, and puts debriefers up on a pedestal and makes it something about what that debriefer is doing. So what I chose to do is actually not tell stories, but do something I'm quite comfortable with, that we do a lot on our blog and our podcast, and look at a journal club, look to the literature to see if there's some help that we can get on, these, uh, on answering some of these questions. How do we do that other type of knowledge translation, which is take some of the skills, or be them maybe quite rudimentary that we've learnt through teaching on APLS or teaching on just our BLS sort of programs in hospital and start to actually see, that, see some manageable frameworks to tackle the debrief conversations. So the case that we're going to look at um, is the case, we always try for a kind of catchy name for our uh, monthly journal club. So this is the case of the disappearing debriefer. Um, our protagonist this month is uh, Jesse, no resemblance at all, and he's a nurse educator with a, uh, quite a bit of experience in sim, yet every time there's been a clinical event that he's been involved in and he sort of sees, he gets that feeling of, oh yeah, we really probably need to talk about that, we need, need to have a debrief about that, there's some probable learning in there, he goes, mm, uh, someone else will do it, I don't, yeah, no, I, I don't really feel comfortable to do that. So the two articles we're going to look at in maybe helping us answer, one, why? Why do we step away from debriefs or why do we let them not happen when the general consensus about the team, through the team is usually, yeah, we could learn a bit from that one. Um, so the two we're going to look at is a fantastic article called Let's Talk About It um, by Walter Epic, who is a, one of the debriefing gurus, one of those people that um, has the way that his work has been interpreted, I should say, has made debriefing seem a little bit inaccessible, but one thing that he does a fantastic job of with Adam Cheng, the fourth author on that paper, is making frameworks that we can use. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a script or a framework approach to debriefing in clinical events. So this is actually how to translate this out of your sim experience. The other one that's really important, and we'll get to why, is the role of psychological safety. So what I'm going to do first is get you guys to, for a couple of minutes, have a chat to the person next to you or the people next to you, and I, I want you to sort of talk about two things. One, have a think. Do you debrief clinical events in your workplace often enough? And if the answer to that is yes, great, then actually dive into why. why, why that, what are the factors that enables that to happen? If the answer to that is no, have a think and have a talk about the main reasons you think you don't. So I'm going to give you two minutes. There's a point to this. Good thing I bought. They go, the good, good project, the chat. They um, they're really long distance, and it's actually the rule library, and we're changing their slides at the same time. So now we've got great. It's like I knew.
might be more than two minutes. We might come back in at the risk of breaking out great learning conversations. Excellent. Thank you. I've tried that before a couple of times and it's very hard to regain control of the masses. So this is, that's actually a really good working example of a uh, rescue within an ongoing um, piece of education that we just found out that I was uh, changing the slides of someone in an adjacent room. So. <laughs> So perfect timing to have a built-in rescue strategy for that. So given that we don't have time to actually for me to individually go around and, um, and ask what your concepts are, what I'm going to do is um, quite arrogantly throw you my main reasons why I think we don't do this very well. And it kind of comes back to one key element, psychological safety. This... I like to think of this really as split into two concepts of, of why we don't take those basic debriefing skills that we actually feel quite comfortable in in a controlled sim lab or even an in situ sim environment and do them in cl real clinical events. One, because we perceive it as being very high risk to us. It's got a high interpersonal risk. It's, it puts us in a really uncomfortable position as the person facilitating the debrief. Um, and two, there's this funny ingrained perception that it might be damaging to our team. And this is one of the things I really, really want to separate out. What I'm not talking about is critical incident debriefing. This is not a psychological debrief. This is not a wellness debrief I'm talking about. This is an, a learning conversation and an operational debrief. So this is our hot debrief triggered by a clinical event. One of the key things is actually looking at what are those triggers? What are the clinical events that are relevant to us thinking, hey, this is a good opportunity for a debrief? And I'm gonna throw it out there, it can be anything, anything that we think there's learning in for the team, particularly for the team. If there's learning maybe for one individual, that's where it could potentially be harmful putting them on the hot seat in the whole group and sort of p pulling out their individual learnings, unless you've got a real confident relationship with that. So the issue, for psychological safety, and I'm not talking about everyone sitting around and cuddling and feeling warm and fuzzy, but I'm talking about basically creating environments where it's everyone feels safe to take into personal risks. That's Jenny Rudolph's words, not mine. She's far smarter than me and has written on this stuff. So the concept sort of for me of breaking an understanding down of why we don't take this out of the sim lab is in the sim lab, it's they. In a sim, they are doing it, I am watching. So I'm behind a screen, I'm watching, I've orchestrated this, I've got control over it to a degree um, within a realm of expected actions, but I know what's going on, I've got control over it, it's in my head and it's them doing it. So that does a really important thing for me when I'm thinking about myself as the debriefer. I'm the debriefer. It lets me sort of take on a character, it lets me create psychological safety in all the ways that Jenny explains how to do it in a sim lab environment or creating a safe container for learning. It lets me actually do the pre-brief. lets me show uh, fallibility and vulnerability through very carefully chosen stories and interactions and body language and stuff. The problem is, when it's in our clinical environment, it's we. And psychological safety is something that's created by the culture of our department or our unit. It's created by every interaction I've had with other members of the team in both that clinical event just then, but also in all of my other interactions that I have um, all the time. So if there's an environment generally where it doesn't feel safe to actually take an interpersonal risk, to show your vulnerability and fallibility and probe sort of for learning out of those opportunities, out of the failure that um, has been such char so characteristically talked about by Ross and Henry over the last couple of days, then it's much, much easier for us to go, yeah, that didn't go well or that went really well and there's opportunity for learning, but I just, just don't feel safe to tackle this. So one of the things then is, how, look, this is where we can start to think about um, Walter's paper, which is re a really useful framework. These guys published some time ago the Pearls framework. Hands up who's from a nerdy sim sort of 
um, background and not, is aware of this Perl's framework for debriefing. Oh, good, good. There's, there's a few in the audience. Doesn't matter, we're going to go through it anyway. So the Perl's framework for simulation um, debriefing gives a structure, it's a promoting excellence in learning framework. It gives a structure or a, 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 an approach to debriefing. It's, I've grossly oversimplified it for the purposes of this, but what they've done in the, in the paper, the Let's Talk About It paper, was change some of the points in that to actually reflect that we're talking to our clinical team, not learners. So, so it's focused about actually having a learning conversation and a clinical coaching conversation as opposed, as opposed to uh, being directed at learners, we're calling them our team. So one of the things we're going to do after this, and this goes back to some of the work um, that Jenny's done around psychological safety, is when is actually setting the environment and setting up as some of that psychological safety for for the conversation that's going to ensue. So I'll get you to just picture we've just finished um, and finished resuscitating a 12-month-old with bronchiolitis. The retrieval teams come and pick them up. Um, at, I work at, out at Redcliffe, so we won't necessarily be keeping a kid that's going to PICU. We have limited PICU capabilities in, the, uh, in our hospital. So they've been picked up, they're gone. There's a finite finish to that point. We're all sort of standing around, starting to tidy up, doing that, getting operationally ready to go on to the next task. And everyone's kind of going, oh, yeah, yeah. there's a, just that, that bit of a feel in there. Someone, and if no one else is doing it, it's you, has the opportunity there to go, hey, do you think we should have a debrief? Do you think we should actually have a bit of a chat about how that went? So from that, from that point, pulling up a chair or just finding a spot, we find uh, the, the cases that I've done with this, this is where you do start to move and dismiss a little bit out of the, the sim lab environment where you're told to go and do it somewhere different and somewhere separately. Pragmatically, that's usually a problem in a busy uh, department. So it's saying, hey, we're just going to stop doing everything for a couple of minutes. Let's spend five to ten minutes as a, as a group having a conversation about um, how that went and seeing if there's anything we can learn from it. We're going to be finished here definitely by ten past. So, and from there we can actually finish p packing up. So we've set the logistics and the expectations. Then your next step would be going, if everyone's okay, I might just ask a few questions and kind of get us rolling and lead the conversation until we get started talking about it. So you're actually seeking permission for, for guiding it, but again, you're not setting yourself out as me debriefing you guys, which is a really important difference, I think. It, it's still, still saying there's going to be some framework and structure to this, but um, my goal is just to have us talking. So you, from that point, we move through the Pearls framework and we're going into reactions. This is something I really struggled a lot with when I started doing sim debriefing is that, and I think one of the things I was taught was that first question, of, oh, so how did that feel? Now, with your team, this is people that you know all the time, they're most likely going to be, oh, don't be a dick. <laughs> it, so I've, I've actually found, and one of the phrases that's, that's um, quoted in this is a really good stimulus one, and it works really well, is, hey, is there any initial reactions that people want to get, off, get out there? And then, when we're actually putting on our hat as facilitator of this learning conversation, what we do is listen. And basically, don't try and control it too much. There's a temptation there to actually go, oh, no, we're just going to keep to the positive stuff at the moment and really start to control that. It's called reactions phase. If you're controlling their reactions, they're not reacting. So... This is a really important data gathering phase for us to actually frame and steer the conversation. So listening to what they're saying is, oh, that felt terrible, or, oh, yeah, the, oh, this bit of equipment just wouldn't, the laryngoscope blade just wouldn't click in. There was something, or maybe, it's, maybe it's the wrong blade or something, or oh, we didn't have this bit of gear, and oh, I just thought the retrieval guys just didn't really explain what they wanted. So just listening to that sort of stuff and seeing if there's points particularly, the ones I'm listening for there are things that I'd observed that I want to talk about as well. And when you get those things coming up multiple times from the, from the group, you're hearing that, those popping up. They're the ones that you can go, okay, these are going to be the things we really latch on and have a discussion about. So that reactions phase is like your data gathering. Then, the then there is a really important bit of the description phase because 
bear in mind through the course of these sorts of cl uh, most clinical events that we're talking about of any significance where we're going to be debriefing is people come in and add to the team, leave the team, come back to the team in an ad hoc fashion all the way through. And there can often be a lot of ambiguity and, and misunderstanding left at the end as to what actually happened, what went on. So getting a summary or a, just a clear very clinical, black and white as possible, case description of the event. So 12 months old, with bronchiolitis, had three days of, it, um, of illness, w was clearly deteriorating when, um, when they came in. We moved pretty quickly to intubation and activated the retrieval team. Um, has anyone, did, it, did anyone see anything different to that? So just kind of getting a, a group truth. The important thing for that is twofold. We're getting an absolute clarity of the clinical case, but we're also sort of establishing that kind of group truth finding and the social proof sort of stuff that's going to be important for when we decide about what we're going to potentially improve from that, that practice. The next phase that they go into with the pearls, this PEARLS framework um, is the analysis phase. This is where we get a little bit tricky and it is, and essentially it's about choosing the, the right method for the time that you've got and for the objective that you're wanting to achieve that you think is strongest. And use the reaction phase, the data gathered during that reactions phase to actually guide that a little bit as well. So this is definitely your most time consuming mode of doing it. But if there's one very strong prevailing thing that's come through out of the reactions phase and some, um, some confusion that's come through in the, in the discussion about the description of the case, it might be well worth spending your full sort of remaining seven minutes of time in this focused deep dive. This is really where you're looking at exploring something that has potentially different rationales for it. So different rationales for action. So it's not a time-based measure. It's not, a, it's not something that can be really nutted down to objective. The thing that's really important in this is catching your own sort of feelings in this and, and taking that, uh, that approach of trying to understand their frame because it might be black and white to you. So it's taking that pause and going, hang on, hang on there might be different reasons for why, that, why this unfolded the way it did. If that's, if that's kind of that inner feeling that you're getting after listening to the responses, the focus deep dive approach can be really, really useful. And you can use different types of questioning to get that going. More sort of open questions are a bit fraught because it can go off on tangents. I find that kind of um, advocacy inquiry type question could be really good with this, this sort of approach where, you, where you're saying, I observed this, I wondered, uh, you can even put a, put a slight judgment on it, I observed this, at that point the team started to really, uh, I, I thought the team started to really fracture, I wondered what you guys think was happening at that point. So, but if you're going down the focus deep dive, you've really got to give a crap about the answer to the question you've asked. This is a big trap that I got into a lot when I started trying to play around with AI type questioning. Is like getting fancy, crafting these questions and going halfway through it going, oh God, I really don't, don't actually care. This, the, this isn't going to be great yield of learning out of this. So actually only ask those sort of focus deep dive questions if you're genuinely baffled and curious as to what the answer is going to be. This technique, most times, for me, works really, really effectively, the plus delta technique. Really, it's quick, dirty, high yield debriefing of learner self-assessment, or in this case, team self-assessment. What went well? What would we change? And there's different approaches to this. I've done some really surprisingly basic approaches to this of just going around and giving each person in the team an opportunity to say it, or floating it out. The thing to be aware of, I guess, is not everyone feels the need to talk to be learning from that situation. So sometimes putting people on the spot. But again, this is we. This is the team that you work with all the time. This is really, really useful for when you're time poor as well. And you can get more into that yield of uh, two, three, four key sort of objectives out in your time frame where the focus deep dive would only yield you one in that time frame. Then we've got the case where there is a big knowledge um, and knowledge differential or skill differential in the group, and it's and that that's this is an area where um, your normal relationship with that team is really really important. So if if I was working with Ben and Ben's uh, Ben's a respected consultant with a with a known and respected skill set in a particular area, 
there's been a major performance issue. We just haven't been able to intubate, for example. A, there was a real technical issue um, or there was a failure to recognise uh, something that was that kind of came through from that reactions phase as just being a clear knowledge deficit. Moving into that directive feedback, this is where we're really taking that role and actually the, the one time in that clinical event debriefing where we're stepping out and taking a very instructive teaching role. If you're going to do this, this, is a, this approach is really useful to have objective data to drive it. So if there's a time-based measure, so like it took four minutes to give first shock to, a, to VF. So that's, none of the team are going to see that that's a good performance. No one's happy with that. There may be technical contributors to that. So that may be a point at which you say you've had a, a and it's a very junior team in recess that day. So you, you take your team, you actually can even go to the point of standing people around and really going through role allocation. And then that, that's just one example of a much more directive structured feedback, but wherever possible using objective quantifiable data to drive those sorts of conversations, which is important as well as a consideration when you're building sims to have some of those data points in there. Coming to the end, very close. Um, so then one of the really important things about these learning conversations is really aiding people to see how that th we're going to carry the, carry the things that we've talked about out of here into ongoing practice. So what do we need to do from here? The big, big difference with clinical event debriefing is that we have an opportunity to immediately impact our own clinical governance cycles, make changes, ergonomic changes or equipment changes. And one of the key things like this is actually agreeing on who's going to do that, who's going to take this out of this um, this case, and what are we going to, and how are we going to feed back to the rest of the group we've done it. So in this case, yeah, there was actually a, a faulty lead on the defib. So that's great. We've just talked about that, but if no one actually is is actioned and tasked to take that away and get that replaced or get all of the defibs in the department checked by um, tech services or, or anything, then we've missed the whole learning out of that, the translation. So we've done a bit of a speed dating for debriefing. Um, these two sites, totally unbiased and impartial, have a lot of good resources um, and hopefully to help sort of translate some of the literature that's out there around simulation out of the more academic centres into usable stuff. The thing I wanted to kind of finish off with is really when we start to realise that it's not about me and it's not about they in our clinical event debriefing and it's about we, we stop thinking that we're a rubbish debriefer. Debriefing is a social event and we're, what we're trying to do is actually have a learning conversation. Thanks.